Okay, everybody. Um, Unit 7, Global Conflict. This has mostly to do with uh, the two world wars um, and the events surrounding them, the events that connect them. I don't think you will get a specific question um, on either of the two world wars, at least for an essay. You may get a multiple choice. Um, you're more likely going to use, if you're going to use the world wars, will be in the context of what they caused. Um, and how they led to things in the back half of the 20th century, or possibly to do with some of the, uh, you know, with the genocides related to that. Simply because AP World tends to stay away from a lot of Eurocentric content um, on the tests and really in the key concepts, uh, but you're going to see some of the information come in there. So, um, going to go through topic by topic. Um, here's your learning objective, the historical developments for each section. Um, make sure you're familiar with that. And really for all of the review, as you go through your review uh, packets and your review materials, you want to be focusing on these learning objectives. Make sure you can do that for the majority of the content we've covered year to date. And if you can't, that's when you come in and see me and we do some review either um, right in class while we're working on stuff or um, after school would be a great time to do that, or if you can stay for the three to five review. Okay, so um, Romanov dynasties. This is, has to do with the, the revolutions that take place and the collapses of the major empires in and around the period before and, and during World War I. Okay, so you have first the Romanov dynasty. That is Russia. Okay, um, the Tsar is overthrown and executed. There are two revolutions. There's the March Revolution, and then the more significant one, the Bolshevik Revolution, which is let when Lenin takes power. Uh, this will lead to civil war, and eventually the Red side or Lenin side, the communists, will win, and they will establish the so Soviet Union. Um, kind of the external factors that lead to the collapse of the Romanovs are the losses in World War I, especially because the Tsar himself takes personal command of the armed forces, they continue to lose. People have lose face in them. Uh, the Lenin piece comes in because Germany actually helps Lenin get to Russia in exchange for agreeing that Russia will exit the war when he takes power. Okay, so that's really what you need to know in Russia. Think about the long-term causes of um, the authoritarian rule of the Tsar and the lack of rights and freedoms for people also. Qing Dynasty, that's China. Okay, the last dynasty. Um, you had the whole series of events in the 19th century that I've covered already in previous videos. Um, you have the Boxer Rebellion at the very end of the 19th century that kind of is the foreshadow for the collapse of the Qing Dynasty because it really only has about 10, 12 years to run after that. Okay, um, The Qing attempted a series of reforms. Those reforms continue on past them, trying to create uh, a more uh, democratic society. Eventually, Sun Yat-sen takes power. He is kind of the George Washington of democratic China. Um, he's a long-term hero there. He borrows both from dem the democratic side and the communist side. He will eventually establish the Republic of China and the political party called the Kuomintang, often called the KMT, which will eventually fight the civil war with uh, the communists to... Um, lead to the establishment of communist China in 1949, but that's more in Unit 8. Okay, um, problems, things that led to this. The spheres of influence, the European powers um, controlling a piece of China. The unequal treaties in China between those that kind of the spheres of influence grew out, the post-opium wars. Um, later in the 19th century, you had the Sino-Japanese War, where um, the Japanese win, this causes China to lose control of Korea, and really you have a shift in the power uh, base in East Asia where Japan becomes the dominant power and will be the dominant power militarily um, up until the end of World War II, and then will remain a dominant economic power and be more dominant economically than China really up until the 1990s and the early 2000s. Finally, the Ottoman Empire, who we've talked about extensively, uh, being so big and strong, but in the 19th century, it begins to crumble. Um, and a lot of that has to do with nationalism, both um, 
Turkish nationalism with the Young Turk movement, but also nationalism among the conquered people in the in, in the European part of the Ottoman Empire. It's in the Balkan territory with the Slavs wanting their own self-determination um, and the Arabs um, wanting to break away from Turkish control. World War I, major factor here. Um, and again, that the two uh, kinds of nationalism, both in the north and the south surrounding Turkey. Okay. Um, Influence of World War I on empire. British Empire. Promises made to the colonial people if they aided the war. This was that DBQ we did, the things they promised to the people and the fact that the promises were broken. They offered them, um, especially India, um, they offered them self rule and a lot more say in their local government. They don't deliver on that. And this continues to brew uh, the animosity within the British Empire. Um, you have the mandate system put in the Middle East where the uh, the British and French basically divide up what is now modern-day Lebanon, Syria, Israel, Jordan, and Iraq into um, their own separate uh, kind of colonies almost. They call them mandates. They're under the auspices of the League of Nations. Um, and they're supposed to be managing these territories till the people are ready to rule themselves. The people were ready to rule themselves already, but um, due to oil more than anything, there's just too much at stake in the Middle East, and the British and the French see they're an opportunity to grab some power, and they do. Um, the French basically has Syria and Lebanon. They follow a lot of the same issues of dissatisfaction in the colonies. If you remember the decolonization DBQ we did, uh, because they didn't make they made promises to their colonial peoples, and they don't deliver either. Okay. Mexican Revolution, you're probably not going to see a lot on this. You might catch a multiple choice on it because it was the topic of the DBQ last year. You're not going to be have to really probably expect to write about this. Uh, but it's similar to a lot of the other national, it's, it's, I guess it's more emblematic of what went on in Latin America in the early part of the 20th century. Um, opposition to neocolonialism, basically Americans with a little bit of European influence trying to use economics to take control of these countries. America invaded parts of, of Latin America over and over again in the first half of the 20th century to overthrow dictators and try to protect our economic in, in, uh, interests. Okay, and we use the Monroe, Monroe Doctrine to keep others out. Um, one of the other big causes here is the poor working and living conditions for the working class people, both factory workers and farmers. And then you've had a dictatorship somewhat propped up by the U.S. under Diaz uh, that's very be grown very popular. The results are the dictatorship is under overthrown, but there's really a 10-year conflict uh, that takes place between 1910 and 1920 in Mexico before it settles down into um, a more Republican-style government. Um, you have some charismatic leaders, Pancho Villa, Emilio Zapata, both of who um, have their run in power, both of who run up against the United States uh, because they're violating our interests. One of the big outcomes here is the reduced power of the Catholic Church. Prior to uh, the revolutionary period, the Catholic Church was a major power player in Mexico. Um, and they're really, they don't benefit economically from any of the reforms um, that are put in place by the revolution until much later. Okay, World War I, major causes here. Here's your historical development. Um, not going to spend a ton of time on this. You're going to want to pause this. This is the militarism, alliances, imperialism, nationalism, the main causes. We did those in class. So you have notes on these. Um, write down what you need on here. Pause the video to get that. It's basically, these are the long-term causes that start the war, that turn Europe kind of into a powder keg, that it only takes that um, spark of the assassination of the Austrian Archduke to get it going. Okay, effects of World War I. Biggest effect is the weakening of Germany and Germany being embittered by the treaty that was put in place, the Treaty of Versailles, um, that really uh, punished them severely, took away land, took away a lot of national pride, and all of these set up the rise of Hitler and Mussolini uh, you know, benefits there. You have extremist leaders. You have the establishment of the USSR post-World War I. You have the collapse of Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman Empire. In the in Middle East, again, the Ottomans are gone. You set up the mandate system. Um, the British had promised the Jews 
um, a homeland in Palestine. They don't deliver. We'll get to that later. They also had po promised the Arabs um, a lot of autonomy or uh, and self-determination in the Middle East, and they don't deliver there. India, this is the classic decolonization thing here. Um, they broke promises for greater self-rule uh, that they promised the Indians for their help in fighting World War I. Uh, Gandhi really comes to the forefront post-World War I with his plan of nonviolence. Some of the key uh, highlights of this period in the Indian independence movement are the Amritsar massacre, where the British basically send the troops in and mow down uh, nonviolent people. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. And also the Salt March, not the Salt Marsh, um, autocorrect there. And then in Asia, it's really uh, Japan becomes the rising power and China um, has their civil war. All right. The conduct of World War I. Again, here's your learning objective, historical documents. Uh, total. This is a total war, meaning everything is directed towards the war effort. Um, you have political propaganda, you have art, you have media, intensified nationalism. All of these are used to mobilize the people towards war, to modify, motivate them to sacrifice um, and to, to glorify the efforts of the soldiers, but also to create uh, resentment and hatred of the other side. Um, and this creates a lot of the, the, the climate to punish the Germans after the war. Okay, um, technologies that come into place, there are a lot of new ones. Um, trench warfare, not, while not really a, a conflict, this is the biggest reason for um, the increased casualties because you have these people living in the, in the shells, in the, the, the trenches, and they're just bombing each other. And the biggest reason for the, high, the higher casualties than any other war before it is the outmoded tactics. Um, you have more modern weapons in World War I, um, but they, they're still fighting with the tactics with less effective weapons. So um, got gas being used, machine guns, and the introduction of the tank along with the airplane and several other uh, new technologies. Okay. Um, World War I was a global war, and it was mostly a global war because you had the colonial citizens fighting for the mother country, you had Africans, Indians, the Anzacs, or Australians, and New Zealands, and then you have sea battles across the planet. Okay, so this is really where it's a global war. It's more the people coming to fight, even though most of it is fought in Europe. Okay, women play a huge role in World War I. They work in the factories. They take the jobs to keep the machine, the machinery running and the weaponry and everything else getting to the front line. And then many serve as nurses um, in the field hospitals, but also um, when the, uh, the, the injured soldiers are returned home. Okay, effects of the Paris Peace Conference and the Treaty of Versailles. Um, it's really all about the punish, the harsh punishment of Germany and the out, fallout from that leading to the rise of Hitler. Um, and it's really, this peace treaty, it really only creates a 20 year pause in the wars. Okay. The economy of the interwar period is probably along with the Treaty of Versailles, the biggest factor in creating World War II. Okay. You had the Great Depression, and again, that's probably the biggest thing. This is a worldwide crisis. This is not just the U.S., uh, but it's kind of a chain reaction of things. Germany um, owes the United States money that they borrow from U.S. banks to um, pay their reparations to the French and British. Um, the U.S. calls their debts because we're having a banking crisis. The Germans are unable to pay. So the French are unable to pay, uh, French and British are unable to pay us, and it kind of sets off a train reaction that leads to the stock market crash, and then eventually um, uh, the Great Depression with the unemployment, which creates the, the climate for extremist rule, and eventually World War II, okay? Uh, some of the economic programs that come in there and how they increase the government involvement in uh, the economy. You have the Keynesian economics, which basically postulates that government should spend money and even run deficits in times of economic depression or recession to um, fill the gap made and to help create jobs. The New Deal is a classic example of Keynesian economics because they designed a variety of programs, uh, both public works and relief programs, designed to end the Great Depression. And they make a dent 
But the thing that really ends the Great Depression is the, the, the huge um, factory output of World War I. The fascist corporate economy is really kind of where the, the, the government really works together closely with big business, um, outlawing union, unions, and cracking down on any kind of freedom or reform efforts. Um, and they marshal all the resources towards the state and towards helping be big business. Okay. Uh, Russian Revolution already talked a little bit about this. Okay, the leaders here are the Tsar Nicholas, uh, Lenin, Trotsky, and Stalin. Uh, causes authoritarian rule in World War I and all the pieces that go with that. The goal of Lenin, at least the stated goal, was to offer the people peace, ending World War I, give them land, give them bread, enough to eat. Okay, it results in the execution of the Tsar, civil war, eventually the establishment of the Soviet Union, and finally it leads to 30 years of dictatorship under Joseph Stalin and then continued dictatorship after the death of Stalin. Okay, um, some of the leaders, we spent some time with these guys in class. I'm not going to do too much here. Um, Mussolini in Italy, uh, a lot of his rise comes from Italy. doesn't think that they got a fair deal at Versailles either. They didn't get everything they thought was promised to them. Uh, they have some economic issues, so his goals are to improve the economy, um, land reform, stop socialism, and revive the greatness of Rome. It leads to a dictatorship with very little freedom, rigged elections, uh, no freedom of the press. Fascism in, in Civil War in Spain, uh, this is General Francisco Franco. It's really the Civil War is um, fascist, backed by Hitler and Mussolini against communists supported by the USSR. Franco wins, the fascists win, and they will stay in power until the 1970s, but they will not participate in World War II. Okay, then you have um, this repressive regime in Brazil, and it's very similar to Mexico. It's under a man named Vargas. It's a military dictatorship. What they claim is they're establishing the Estado Novo or the new state. Um, big emphasis on economic independence, Many of the same goals of Mexico um, and the effects are industrialization, but also a lot of social welfare in initiatives to um, you know, with relief programs and things like this. And a lot of this comes out of, again, the Great Depression and the economic crises that go along with it. OK, uh, in Russia, you had uh, and the communist countries, you had some other pacts uh, post uh, civil uh, the Civil War. Lenin puts in what's called the new economic policy because they had really cracked down during uh, the Civil War on the economy and a lot of control, and they try to loosen things up um, by offering some private ownership. This is very successful, but it's also temporary because when Stalin takes power, he implements the five-year plans, which are centrally planned economies, and it, can, it creates what's called a command economy. We'll talk more about this when we get into communism. Um, Rapid industrialization, the, uh, the, the key points of this is rapid industrialization to catch up with the West, um, and it's very successful. Remember, Russia had no unemployment during the Great Depression. In China, we spent a little bit of time talking about the Great Leap Forward um, a few weeks ago. Uh, this is China's version of the five-year plan system. It fails miserably, results in famine. They had tried to have home steel mills or commune-based steel, steel mills, and the steel that they created was useless. Ends up with 43 million people dead um, and more, you know, in bad shape. Okay. Unresolved tensions after World War I. Uh, make sure you read through the historical developments. You can do the learning objective. Okay. whole lot of things. A lot of it has to do with territorial gain. Some of these we've already talked about. Great Britain and France getting the... Um, take basically taking over the German colonies and the, and the old territories of the Ottoman Republic. The French get Alsace and Lorraine back. Um, this leads to a lot of issues in their colonies because they don't really get what was promised to them during the war. Germany, I've talked several times about, they lose a ton of land um, from Germany proper. They lose all their colonies, again, leading to bitterness, desire for revenge, creates the climate for Hitler. Japan, I haven't talked a lot about yet. Um, they gained the German territories in the Pacific, which are mostly islands. Um, and in 1931, they invade Manchuria, which is in northeastern China, um, to get their hands on the natural resources that are there. Um, and this is really Japan's rise into power to the point where they decide to conquer East Asia 
um, which leads to World War II. A little more on that in a minute. Okay, mandate system. Um, you know, this is a series of broken promises. Um, the British had, and the French had promised um, things to the Arabs and the Jews to give them a lot more independence. The Jews were promised a homeland. Um, and then they go back on all of these and take it over themselves. This is really the root of the Arab-Israeli conflicts and leads to revolts post-World War II in Syria and Iraq and elsewhere. Um, the Balfour De Declaration was a promise made by the British government to Jews to create a homeland in what is called Palestine, which is modern-day Israel. This will lead to the Arab-Israeli conflict because the Arabs are already there and the British are basically giving away their territory and eventually the establishment of Israel in 1948. Okay, anti-colonialism in South Asia. This is the Indian independence movement. Okay, several things happen here. You have the massacre at Amritsar, British massacre, peaceful uh, demonstrators. And this is really a PR disaster for the British. Okay, You've got British government firing on unarmed people. Uh, British is condemned worldwide. It really starts wheels rolling. Gandhi um, is the major factor. He is the indispensable man in the India, Indian independence movement and his program of nonviolence uh, paints the Indians in a very good light and the British in a bad light. Salt March, probably one of the most famous of Gandhi's nonviolent actions. He leads a march of you know, a few hundred people from his home um, in the hinterlands to the sea to make salt in defiance of a British ban. The British had said, you can't make your own salt. You have to buy it from us. Um, and Gandhi defied this. Um, the British only option is to start throwing people in jail. They didn't want to do this. So again, it's a major PR victory for Gandhi. Um, eventually, it leads to a two-state system when India is divided because of the conflict between the Muslims and the Hindus. Um, the partition of India takes place. It's a very violent process. There will be future wars between India and Pakistan, and both are nuclear powers. Um, to balance off against each other, okay? Nationalism in, in the East Asia, uh, Korea rebelling against Japanese colonialism in the March 1st movement, the May the 4th movement, this doesn't have anything to do with Star Wars, okay? This is an anti-imperialist and cultural political movement, kind of building off the Boxer Rebellion ideas, um, eventually will lead to the Communist Party. May the 4th was a day of a massacre of people, um, the Long March is a military retreat by Mao's Red Army. Um, it's a propaganda, it becomes a propaganda tool to justify Mao's revolution, launches Mao as the major leader of the communists in China, but it also allows him to build the Red Army. And you kind of have a two, couple of two-state systems in uh, the Far East, okay, or in East Asia. People's Republic of China, what we would think of as China nowadays, and Taiwan, which is where the Republican forces, the people that were defeated in the Civil War by the communists, establish a base of operations, and they are still there. They're not technically a free country, or a, it depends on how they're seen. Not a lot of the world recognizes them as free because they don't want to make big China mad. Okay, and Then you have the Koreas divided also between communist North, uh, democratic South. These are both sources of tension in East Asia. Okay. Um, Resistance movements that begin to crop up because of this. China resist and, and Manchukuo resisting Japan. It's because of the Japan Japanese seizure of Manchuria. Eventually leads to Jap the, the World War II in in Japan and China fighting another war. Indian National Congress is trying to gain independence from Great Britain. It Britain uh, India will become the first colony to gain independence. Leads to partition. Um, the West African strikes in Congresses again. It's the beginning of the independence movements in Africa. Okay, 7.6, causes of World War II. Um, been over a lot of these, okay, so they're pretty, um, should be pretty easy to get. You got the Treaty of Versailles, Great Depression, imperialism, which is really the German desire for conquest in Europe and Soviet Union, okay. Um, nationalism and militarism in Germany, the glorification of culture and, and military, and they use that to push for, uh, to overturn the Treaty of Versailles and territorial gain. Appeasement is when the Germans um, demand part of Czechoslovakia that is a, a minority German population, and France and Britain give it to them in 1938. Um, 
the, the totalitarian regimes that rise up, a lot of that comes out of the economic conditions and World War I um, and the countries that it happens in. And eventually those dictators will clash. All right. Con the conduct of World War I or World War II, um, you know, Japan, it's invading Manchuria and then China and then eventually Pearl Harbor and their attempt to conquest, uh, conquest of all of East Asia. Germany, we've been through a lot of this with the, uh, the, the steps that they took uh, to expand uh, across Europe. Make sure you're familiar with some of these, uh, though I don't think you'll have to have them um, uh, with a lot of command. Okay, some of the um, great leaders. You have Churchill in Great Britain. Um, he is known just as bulldog personality and refusing to negotiate with the Germans, um, even when it looks like Britain could be defeated. Um, FDR in America, you've got the neutrality that he is fighting against um, as he sees the war coming, but America is still very neutral, neutral minded, um, isolationist. We begin arming the British through the Lend Lease program, um, and the Atlantic Charter is one of his big pieces there. Um, with it sets forward in motion a lot of the events of the post war world. And then, you know, Stalin um, really kind of bet, paints himself into a corner with his purges. So he signs the non aggression pact with Hitler, but Hitler invades anyways. You have the great victory at Stalingrad. And then, really, for all three of these guys, you have the Yalta and Potsdam conferences, though you have a different U.S. president at Potsdam with Harry Truman there all leading to the occupation of Eastern Europe by the Soviet Red Army and the beginning of the Cold War. Okay, some tactics and things that came out of there, atomic bombs, um, you know, just killing lots of people. Um, kind of falling short of that, you had fire bombing, um, Dresden country, also Tokyo, basically just burning cities to the ground. Um, and the idea of total war, example, would be Soviet Union. They mobilized, total war is simply the mobilize, mobilization of all resources for the war effort. Okay. Home fronts play a big role. I mean, the U.S. with the arsenal is the big place. This place so much because we're not under attack um, specifically, uh, but there's rationing. You're selling war bonds. You have the women um, taking a big role in, in filling the jobs. Um, and the atomic bomb, Cold War, decolonization, war crimes has consequences. Um, and then you have the mass atrocities. Um, I'm going to leave this so that you can go through these. Um, we've done these in class, just pretty much every one of them. Um, so make sure you pause and get the notes off of this page. And then finally, the causation, the learning objective here, the are being able to uh, explain the relevant significance of the causes of the war. And here's some examples of that. Okay, so that's what you need to know for Unit 7. Um, and I'll be back with Unit 8.